So, what am I going to talk about? Muslim-Jewish relations in the UK. I always start with myself. It's, it's self-obsessed. <laughs> uh, I've lived in the UK since I was two. I came from a very poor family, but thanks to our wonderful education system, I was able to go to Cambridge, and I had a great career as a chartered accountant, retiring six years ago. And I spend a lot of my time in retirement on interfaith relations. Uh, as Adrian said, I'm one of the founders and the co-chair of the Muslim Jewish Forum of Greater Manchester. I chair the Conservative Muslim Forum, which is part of the Conservative Party. I'm involved with the Three Faiths Forum and uh, an education research charity, Curriculum for Cohesion. The most useful thing on this slide is in red at the bottom. It's the address of my website where quite a lot of writings that I might casually mention while I'm talking are located and eventually, hopefully, if everything goes right, this presentation will end up on my website as well. And for that matter, if Finchley Progressive Synagogue wants to put it on your website, you're free to do so because it will be on YouTube so anybody in the world can then embed a YouTube video anywhere that they want. The originator actually has no control over that anyway. So what am I going to talk about? Start with some basic facts about Muslims and Jews in the UK. And then a diversion into theology about the religions themselves. S some thoughts and experiences about willingness of Muslims and Jews in the UK to talk to each other. Why don't we get on? Because in many places we don't get on. And then a bit more about the Muslim Jewish Forum of Greater Manchester, and in particular, why does it work? Because we've been going for 11 years now, so I think we're doing something right, and it wasn't an accident. <clears throat> so, first of all, some basic facts and the common interests of Muslims and Jews in the UK. The census 2011, there are just over 10 times as many Muslims in the UK as there are Jews. The relative sizes of the two communities are very different. And I spoke in April in Bradford to an almost entirely Muslim audience. My subject actually was anti-Semitism. And one of the questions I asked my Muslim audience was, for every Jew in the country, how many Muslims are there? And I got answers that were hopeless. I mean, like sort of two Muslims for every Jew, for example. And it's only when I kept asking the audience, eventually somebody gave me a number that was bigger than 10, and then I told them what the right answer was. Because if you ask most Muslims in this country, and indeed I think if you ask most other non-Jews to estimate the percentage of Jews in the UK, most people would massively overestimate it in terms of the numbers of mentions that you get in the media, for example the Labour Ferrari over anti-Semitism, issues to do with the Middle East conflict, etc. The two communities have been here for very different periods of time because the, the major period of Jewish immigration was from 1880 to about 1920, whereas the significant growth in the Muslim population is much more recent. I mean, there have always been some Muslims in the UK, but the big growth started around about 1960. One of the other differences about the community is that Judaism has some conversions in, but very few. In Islam, it is much more common, and I think there are now probably about 100,000 converts to Islam in this country, people who are ethnically white British, but are Muslims. In terms of parliamentary representation, at one time, the Jewish Chronicle used to publish, after each general election, a list of all the Jewish MPs by name. And I remember when I first became a subscriber, uh, counting them, and I think there were 52 at that time. And 
in relation to the relative percentage of Jews in the country, that was statistically massively overrepresented. I don't know what the current percentage is because I think the JC has stopped publishing the list. Muslims before 1997 was zero. There were no Muslims in the House of Commons before 1997, despite even by then having a you know, million, million and a half or whatever Muslims in the UK. 97 we had one, 2001 we had two, 2005 we had four, uh, 2010 we had eight, including for the first time two Conservatives, because all the ones before were Labour, so two Conservatives and one Labour, and six Labour, that's 2010. And in 2015 we now have 13, one SNP, three Conservatives and nine Labour. So it's growing, but it's still quite small in relation to the percentage of the population as a whole. And there's some obvious reasons for that. One of them, which we'll see in a minute, is age, because there aren't many MPs under the age of 18. And the second is educational standards, and the, the whole issue about the competence and duration of the community in the UK. Educational standards, these are very broad brush statements, of course, but while you can find undereducated Jews, on average, educational standards in the Jewish community, I would say, are high. Amongst Muslims, they have been low, but they are definitely rising and rising strongly. And the other point about is ethnic diversity. Uh, Jews in this country are primarily from Europe, with some North African Jews, but it's a much more homogeneous community ethnically than the British Muslim community, which while at one time it was primarily South Asian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Indian, and even those, you've got very wide ethnic groups. Always remember that India is as diverse as the continent of Europe when it comes to ethnicity. But now we've got major <coughs> Muslim groups in the UK from Africa, from the Middle East, and from other parts of the world. Indonesia, Malaysia. It's a very diverse community ethnically. One of the things I did, I looked at the census, which gives you the data, but it doesn't lay it out very well, and renormalized it. So what I've got here are age groups, you know, children 0 to, 0 to 9, 10 to 19, etc., and the relative percentages of the communities. So for each of these communities, Jews in blue, Muslims in green, if you added up all the percentages, it would actually come to 100%. It's just the actual shape of the community. And what you see is that at the younger end, Muslims are very young compared to Jews. And at the far end, there are a reasonable number of uh, elderly Jews, but at the moment, relatively few uh, elderly Muslims. Although, of course, as time passes, that percentage and the, sh the shape of the community will change. I mean, if you look at the age 60 to 69, 65, I would say that's about 2.5%, and I'm one of those 2.5% because I'm now 65. <coughs> Jews and Muslims in the UK have a large number of common interests which arise, first of all, because we simply are religious in a way that more and more of society is heavily secular. So the fact that we regard holding a religious belief and manifesting a religious belief as important already separates us from large parts of the white British community. Obviously there are plenty of people who are white British who are Anglican or Roman Catholic but a growing percentage are very secular. And secondly we have some specific things that we want to do which many people don't understand. They just don't understand why we want to kill animals without stunning them first, for example. So we have a, a number of issues in common. Faith schools are far more important to us than to people who are white British. Circumcision, again, every so often people try to ban circumcision. There haven't been any serious attempts in the UK, but they may come. I think the city of San Francisco tried at one stage. <laughs> 
although clearly it's not the sort of thing that a city should have jurisdiction over. And this is not a random list, these seven points. This is from the Muslim Jewish Forum of Greater Manchester Declaration of Principles, which uh, our executive adopted when we were sort of first organized, and the list was physically written down by myself and the Jewish barrister, David Barclay QC, because he and I wrote our constitution together, and if you've got a chartered accountant and a QC writing it, you get a constitution in spades. We, we're a company limited by guarantee, registered at company's house. And we also co-wrote the Declaration of Principles. <coughs> now I want to move on to theology. And it's very strange when you know that something is obvious, so obvious that you don't really even need to think about it and explain it, and you meet somebody who doesn't think the same way. And this happened to me on my first ever visit to Lambeth Palace, when I was being shown around and having lunch with somebody, I, it was not the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I'm not going to say who it was, or play 20 questions. But he was, a, he was an Anglican, a senior Anglican, and we, over lunch, he made some kind of comment along the lines of that he thought that Christianity and Judaism were sort of very close together as religions, and that Islam was very, very different. And I was utterly shocked. And I didn't want to have a bust up with him because he just showed me around Lambeth Palace and he was <laughs> buying me lunch. But I went away with a burning determination to write a rebuttal. <coughs> the problem is that at that time I was still working at Price Waterhouse Coopers and I'm rather busy. And of course, whenever something feels like it's going to involve work, you put it off, unless <laughs> There's something that makes you do it. And in this case, there was nothing making me do it. Twelve months later, I wrote some pencil notes on a piece of paper. It took another twelve months before that got converted into something that was written and is now on my website as Triangulating the Abrahamic Fates. And it was partly produced because in between I did a talk to, at King's College School Wimbledon about Islam in the UK and that just gave me the opportunity to cover some of this ground. So the key question is, if you're going to try to decide between Christianity, Judaism and Islam, how close are they to each other, how are you going to decide? What are your criteria for deciding and measuring relative closeness? And I realised that there are two ways you can look at this. One of them is quantitative and the other one is qualitative. And I'll explain what I mean. The first point is that this Anglican has a Bible. And of course in his Bible he has something which he calls the Old Testament and which I understand Jews call the Tanakh, Torah, Nebi and Ketubim. But it's the same books. And I once even checked my Jewish Print Society copy of the Jewish Scriptures which I've got at home in Manchester against a Christian Old Testament to make sure they had exactly the same books in, which it does. And then, of course, as an Anglican, he's got some more bits in the form of the New Testament. So, straight away, and but there's no overlap in textual terms between the Anglican Bible and the Quran. So, in that sense, it's obviously a slam dunk. He's absolutely right. And there's another way of looking, measuring quantitatively, which is to look at the question of prophethood. Um, I've got on here a number of people who Islam regards as prophets, so it's a question of whether Jews would regard Noah as a prophet or not, but he certainly was a man that God was communicating with, because God told him to build an ark. So we've got a number of prophets listed, including some of my favourites, the 12 sort of minor prophets, I've just picked three of them. I've always had a particularly soft spot for Malachi because it's the last book of the Old Testament as printed by the Christians. Oh, of course, not the last book in the Tanakh. <laughs> and then you tag on Christianity and they basically add one more. So a Christian would recognise everybody in the blue circle in this exactly the same way that Jews would recognise them, plus they add on Jesus. And Muslims are somewhat different. Although, unlike 
text where there's no overlap at all in terms of actual words directly between the Quran and the Old and New Testaments, although there is overlap in a lot of stories. I mean, Exodus is there in the Quran, the virgin birth is there in the Quran, etc. But in terms of actual people who get mentioned by name, Adam to Joseph, etc., do get mentioned by name, but the lesser prophets don't. Jesus gets a lot of coverage. Moses, by the way, is mentioned more in the Quran than any other person by name. And Muhammad, is actually, who is mentioned hardly at all by name, he gets a few mentions. He's often addressed by God, but without actually naming him. And some other prophets that like Hud, Salah and Shweig that you won't have heard of at all unless you've actually read the Quran. So again, if you're measuring by sort of counting prophets, this guy who gave me, bought me lunch was right. But there's something in my mind profoundly unsatisfactory by trying to measure the closeness of religions this way. Because religions are not about counting how many pages of scripture you've got. And they're not even about counting how many prophets you have named or how many prophets get named by in particular religious texts. Religion's about something much more important. They're about theology. What does the religion say about the nature of God? The most fundamental question of all in religion. And Judaism and Islam say exactly the same thing. Christianity well, Christians claim to be monotheistic, but I've never quite understood how you reconcile that with the Trinity. Although, in a sense, I mean, I studied physics uh, in my younger days, and in physics, light is both a particle and a wave at the same time. Not at different times, it's a particle and a wave at the same time. So in that sense, the idea that God could be one and three at the same time is at least conceptually possible but it's, but it's definitely not what Muslims and Jews have to say about God. And this point about that God gives us laws which he expects us to follow and which we really believe we should follow. Uh, Islam and Judaism are totally agreed on that. And again, in Christianity the doctrines are quite different. I mean, it's not that Christians believe you should go around committing adultery and believe that you should go around engaging in premarital sex, but they have a different approach to the law and St. Paul says some remarkably rude things about the law and how do you actually get into God's good books and get yourself a place in heaven and again the approach of Judaism and Islam is basically you do what God wants you to do you <coughs> obey him you're good to other people you pray you fast you do all the things that God wants you to do and if you do enough of them and do very few bad things, then you've got a good chance on the Day of Judgment. The Christian doctrine of salvation is entirely different. And when I wrote my paper, I actually referenced the Vatican website for Christianity because I wanted an authoritative statement of what Christianity says. And that's where I went, the Vatican website. And similarly, I found a website for Orthodox Judaism and Islam I knew quite a lot about anyway, but I also double-checked you know, <coughs> scholars. So, in terms of the relative closeness of the religions, I would represent them graphically like this. I think Judaism and Islam are actually pretty close to each other. Incredibly close. I mean, it distorts the, the triangle. You can hardly see the triangle in terms of the separation. I think the only fundamental thing is that some of the practical doctrines of Judaism, for example the Sabbath, Islam does not have a Sabbath. We are encouraged to go to congregational prayers on Fridays at lunchtime, but on Friday you can work just like any other day as long as you go and pray at the time you're supposed to go and pray. We don't have a concept of a chosen people. So there are some differences, but they're minor. And I experience this when I go to the synagogue, which I do occasionally, since I got involved in the Muslim Jewish Forum, and a sign, by the way, of why the forum was necessary was that I had lived in Manchester, the second largest Jewish city in the UK, for 52 years. I'd had Jewish friends at school, at university, I had Jewish colleagues at work, I had Jewish clients, I 
I'd attended the Seder in New York uh, as a class, but I had never set foot inside a synagogue. And n since then, of course, I've done it quite often. And when I take part in a synagogue service, I don't have any problems totally enthusiastically taking part in the service and the prayers. Because theologically, there is absolutely nothing in the synagogue service that I would have any objection to. When I go to Christian services, which I do occasionally as well, especially with funerals and so on, at times, you basically just shut up. You know, you're singing along for part of it and then you just sort of stop while they talk about Jesus and salvation and some of that stuff. And then you sort of rejoin once you've got some something you can go on with. But it's fundamentally different from Judaism as far as I'm concerned. Which is, and I've drawn the, the triangle lopsided deliberately as well. Because we do have some things in common with Christianity that Judaism does not. I know that Judaism acknowledges that there was a person called Jesus and he did live round about when he's supposed to have lived, but that's it. You have no other theological interest in Jesus whatsoever. He's simply a historical figure. But from Islam's point of view, Jesus was born of a virgin and he's the only person in human history who was born of a virgin. And that's a pretty significant fact as far as Islam is concerned. So that brings Islam closer to Christianity than Judaism in, in terms of the distance between Judaism and Christianity. So that's why the triangle is the way that it is. Now, talking to each other. When I helped to set up the Muslim Jewish Forum of Greater Manchester, I had a secret fear. I didn't share this with anybody else because some fears there's no point in sharing, but I had a, this fear. My concern was that I knew that there were about 10 times as many Muslims as Jews in Greater Manchester. And I was worried that the Muslim Jewish Forum would be swamped with Muslims and not enough Jews. The facts were the exact opposite. We were swamped with Jews and had very few Muslim participants. And I, I've got a theory for, an, for that. I wrote it actually last July. I, I wrote an article in Jewish News. The fundamental diff reasons are why there were, far, there were far more Jews wanting to talk to Muslims than Muslims wanting to talk to Jews. And I think the reasons are, first of all, demographically, individual Jews on average are older than individual Muslims. So while it might be 200,000 plays 20, if you're counting people say over the age of 30, then it's less disproportionate. And the reality is in this country, people get more interested in interfaith dialogue when they're a bit older than when they're very young. When they're teenagers, they're definitely not interested, too many other things to do. And you know, once 30s, 40s, most are attendance has been at the Muslim Jewish Forum, not of very young people. We had some young people, but not very young and average. You also have to be, you're more likely to get involved if you're educated. And again, once you start looking for people who are, say, over the age of 35 or 40 and well educated, you suddenly start to find that it's no longer 10 to 1 at all. It's much different. It even starts to come the other way. And thirdly, there's a question of personal self confidence. And if you and your parents and your grandparents have lived in this country for much longer, you just feel more confident about your place in society than if you're an immigrant yourself, you know, came here in your sort of late twenties, your English ain't perfect, or if uh, you were born here but your parents were not very well educated, you're still relatively recent, you feel more discriminated, so all of those different kinds of factors, I think, what accounts for the disproportionality in the early days. So that was 2005. And then 2006, we had the first Lebanon war. Oh, sorry, the second Lebanon war. No, the first one was in the 1980s. But the conflict in 2006 with Hezbollah and Israel, Muslim attendance plummeted. But we kept going, built back up again. Then we had Operation Cast Lead, exactly the same thing happened, Muslim attendance plummeted, but it built up again. 
One of the things I found really gratifying in 2014 is that we did not have the same effect. When the Gaza conflict of 2014 was happening, it didn't knock down our Muslim attendance. So something has changed with the passage of time. The other thing that's changed with the passage of time is that our Muslim attendance proportionately has been rising. And it's now much more sort of 50-50. It's still not 10 times to 1, which is what you know, the numbers would suggest, but 50-50 is a great deal better than the kind of ratios we had at the beginning. And again, there are some fairly obvious reasons. People are 10 years older. People who were 20 years old when the forum started are now aged 30. People who were 30 are now aged 40. So that change, as people get older, they're more likely to want to get involved in interfaith dialogue. Educational standards have risen. You know, far more people have gone to university and lived through their 20s, or people who were in their sort of early 20s are now in their sort of early 30s. So the educational disproportionality has started to change as well. And of course, the community has been here a little bit longer. They see Muslims in Parliament in a way that they saw less of than originally. You see Muslims on television far more often, Faisal Islam on Sky News, for example, covering politics. So people feel more confident and settled. Why tensions? Uh, the first one, of course, is Israel and Palestine. There is a natural human temptation to take sides automatically. If I'm a Muslim and something is happening over there and involves a Muslim, the first automatic reaction is that you know the Muslim over there is being hard done by, I've got to find some way of supporting him, and everybody else feels the first temp way to react is that way. Although it's not inevitable that you have to stay that way. And people have a different perspective on it. There's also enormous lack of knowledge. I mean, as an illustration of the lack of knowledge, two years ago I was at an Eid function uh, at PricewaterhouseCoopers. This was after I'd retired, but they invited me back to these things. And I was chatting to somebody who was aged 28. I don't know whether he was at PwC or somewhere else. I think he was somewhere else. And I can't remember if he was a banker, lawyer, or accountant. But he was definitely one of those categories, because everybody who was there was in that kind of background. And obviously, a university graduate. With that background, highly educated, working in financial services, he did not know that Israel's Arab citizens were allowed to vote. He just didn't know. I mean, that is the level of ignorance that one is dealing with at times. And if educated people don't know that, just imagine what uneducated people don't know. And one of my more interesting experiences, I've had lots of interesting experiences thanks to the forum, was when I found myself speaking at an Israel advocacy event called the Big Tent for Israel, which took place in Manchester about three years ago, maybe four years ago now. <coughs> I'm one of these people who tends to say yes. Monty rings me up and says, would you like to talk at our synagogue? And straight away you say yes. And David Barclay QC, who was on the organising committee for choosing speakers for the Big Tent for Israel. And I, I agreed with David Barclay, I would speak. He asked me, would you speak at the Big Tent for Israel? I said yes. And then of course you start wondering, what on earth are you going to talk about? Because you can't go to an event like that and tell them that Israel is rubbish and everything it's doing is wrong. And at the same time, you have to be true to yourself. So I decided to address the question of how Israel supporters should talk to Muslims. So I didn't have to say that I was a Zionist or an Israel supporter, although I am an Israel supporter to the extent I believe that Israel has the right to exist within secure and recognized boundaries uh, in a state of peace with countries around it. So if that's what being a Zionist means, I'm willing to you know, be classified as Zionist. But I don't use the word Zionist because it's a very contested word. It means so many different things to different people. So if you're talking about Israel to British Muslims, how should you go about it? Well, first of all, why? Well, the answer is obvious. British Muslims matter politically. They, there are three million of them. They have votes. And with every year that goes by, there will be more voters, there will be more members of parliament. So it's not a community that supporters of Israel should ignore. 
And the question is, how do you talk about it? And the one thing is not to do is to start by talking about the history. Because the history is intensely contentious. It's impossible to get people to agree on the history. And it's simply divisive. Start by trying to agree on the facts as they stand today. Because at least with today's facts, there is a chance of proving them. Like you can demonstrate how many Jews there are in Israel, how many Muslims there are in Israel, how many Muslims there are in the West Bank, how many Muslims in Gaza. And you've got a fighting chance that the person you're talking to will agree with you on those numbers. <coughs> and if, if they won't agree, at least you can talk about how do you resolve this disagreement about the figures. And similarly, talk about things like you know, voting rights inside Israel. <clears throat> and then once you've got some agreement about the facts as they stand today, the next thing is to talk about what people want. And the first thing that the, your Muslim <clears throat> respondent is likely to want, <clears throat> because this is what most Muslims want in my experience, is a binational state. It's what I used to want until David Barclay got me to understand why a binational state is simply not acceptable from a Jewish perspective. And the most powerful way, which is something I, re I referred to on many occasions when I'm speaking on this subject, is the story of the St. Louis. The refugee ship that started from continental Europe, went to Cuba, tried to go to America, but the Americans wouldn't even let it in territorial waters and eventually came back to uh, continental Europe. And I think once you have understand the experience of what it's like to find that nobody in the world will take you in, then you can start to talk about why it's important to have at least one country in the world where at least for the next 60 or 70 years, you know, subject to demographics and so on, there, there will be a Jewish majority in a country that is guaranteed to take you in and explain why the law of return is drafted the way that it is, that one Jewish grandparent is enough to qualify under the law of return because one Jewish grandparent was enough to get persecuted under the Nuremberg laws. So you, once you've explained why a binational state doesn't work, then, and if you're still talking, you're now making real progress in terms of talking about what peace might look like. But that, I believe, is the way to actually talk about Israel with Muslims. And then the other thing which often gets overlooked is problematic Muslim theology. And it's one of those cases where what we're going to look at has always been there. But it's always been there both when relations between Muslims and Jews have been excellent and when they're bad. But when they're bad, of course, people find things and latch on to them and use them as religious justification as well. So when Catholic Spain expelled the Jews and about 80% of them were invited into Ottoman Turkey's empire, the religious texts we're going to talk about were there. You know, they're not brand new texts, they've always been there but it didn't make any difference to the behaviour of, of the Ottoman Turkish state in allowing Jews to come and live in the Ottoman Empire. And I'm not going to cover a lot of uh, text, so I, I offered to do a talk entirely about text, but Adrian said it would be a bit boring, but maybe you know, another time. So I've just got one. And this is from the Quran, and the key word here is allies in this translation, although that word is often translated as friends. And this is often cited by Muslims, especially Muslims who don't like Jews, as a reason why Muslims should not be friends with Jews, or Christians for that matter. The translation, by the way, is quite interesting. Muhammad Assad. Does anybody recognize the name? You do? Pardon? Not, nothing, to do with the nothing to do with the Syrian ruling dictator. This guy was born in the year 1900 as Leopold Weiss, a Polish Jew, converted to Islam at the age of 26, eventually became Pakistan's ambassador to the United Nations, although later on he sort of got, fell out with the Pakistan government and he settled in Spain. 
and in fact he's buried in a cemetery, Muslim cemetery very close to the Alhambra. Mm -hmm. I tried to visit his grave when I visited the Alhambra, but the cemetery was shut. And he's produced one of my favourite translations of the Quran, and very insightful. Given his background, he was not obviously a Muslim extremist or anti-Jewish, which is one reason I think he uses the word allies here, because that conveys the proper sense of the word. This is a verse about self-reliance rather than a verse about who you're pally with. But the question, the point is this, that this is the Quran and it's the word of God. I mean, this is the Muslim view of where the Quran came from. It came directly from God via Gabriel to Muhammad and was recorded shortly afterwards. And the, the text that we have is the text. So there's no question about arguing that the verse shouldn't be there, it shouldn't, that this is the verse from God. But, however, the Quran has to be understood as a whole. And if anybody, if any Muslim ever cites the Quranic verse as a reason for not getting on with Jews, it is sensible or appropriate to ask them some questions. Like, what did God mean by that? What, how does it stand in the relation to the rest of the Quran and what the Quran is saying? And is it the case that maybe it had a different intention when it was revealed 1400 years ago than today because the world the circumstances of the world are different now many muslim extremists try arguing that islam is utterly unchangeable that you have to do everything exactly the way that it was always done in the, the, the very beginning the salafis are particularly prone to this the reality is that islam has always changed and the example I like to quote is a very early one from the second caliph, Umar, who deviated on the district. There's a zakat is a compulsory levy that Muslims pay on their wealth, two and a half percent, into the central treasury of the Islamic State, if there is an Islamic State, as there was at the time of these early caliphs. And in the Quran, it lists the categories of people for whom zakat can be distributed to, like the poor, the needy, etc. But one of the categories is those whose hearts should be reconciled. And that has always been understood by, I mean, this is how the Prophet Muhammad applied it, to those wealthy Meccans who were originally pagans but had converted to Islam as a way of keeping them on side. So you're giving basically charitable funds to wealthy people who don't really need it. And Umar decided that by his time, which was 12 years after the Prophet's death, or 10 years after the Prophet's death, he, he became Caliph two years after the Prophet's death and lasted until 12 years after the Prophet's death when he died. That circumstances had changed, Islam was now well established in Arabia and he no longer needed to give this money to rich people who didn't need it. So he didn't. And that change of practice was change, doing something different from what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had done, and doing something different from what the plain text of the Quran does, because circumstances had changed. And I got this example from a book on Sharia law by a South African scholar, Michael, called Michael Momisa. There's a review of that book on my website. And I have a number of book reviews there as well. Moving on to Hadith. Hadith are records of what the Prophet said. And eschatology is a posh word for things to do with the end of time. I picked it up from reading sort of Christian literature. And this particular verse is extreme, uh, hadith, is extremely famous because of course it's part of the Hamas Charter. It's right in there. And uh, Hamas, I think, started off by being anti-Jewish and then found a hadith to sort of stick into their charter rather than becoming anti-Jewish because they were reading Hadith. It, that's how it works in practice. And another one, I, and I like this one just because it's so odd. The Dajjal is a sort of Muslim antichrist and apparently he'll have 70,000 Jews from Isfahan following him wearing Persian shawls. But where he's going to find 70,000 Jews in Isfahan, given 
the, the, the depopulation of Iran, as far as the Jewish community is concerned, I have no idea. But this hadith is there in one of the books of hadith. And the first thing to be aware of is that the, the way hadith came about. Muhammad <coughs> was the, in charge of the Muslim community, he, he said things, he did things, and of course people remembered that. And they passed on these stories to their children and their children's children, they passed them on to other people by word of mouth. And much later, somewhere between 100, 150, 200, 250 years later, depending on which Hadith collector you're talking about, people started collecting these stories and writing them down. Before that, they were entirely oral. A bit like a lot of rabbinic law, I've just lost the word for the moment, uh, for the way that rabbinic law was passed down in the same way, by word of mouth. And with Hadith, there are many questions that one can ask. The first one, of course, is, is it reliable? And Muslim scholars have put enormous amounts of work into trying to validate Hadith by, first of all, doing some checking on the, the chain. If, if Monty gives me a Hadith and he says that he got it from A, who got it from B, who got it from C, the first obvious test is, were A, B and C and Monty alive at the right times? In other words, if A died before B was born, you know, they, they couldn't have got it from each other. So those kinds of testing can be done. And were they in the same place? You know, if A lived you know, 500 miles from B, it's very unlikely they could ever have met. Less effort was put into validating the text, but of course, even with text, the, t the, the message, the content, if the content just is, looks wrong, that can be a reason for rejecting the hadith. If you think it's reliable, what did the Prophet mean at the time? And do those circumstances apply now? And there's a, a really good book which I read a few years ago on how hadith scholarship works. It's only a couple, few hundred pages long, but as a substitute for reading that book, if you read the book review on my website, I, I went to town on this one, I've got about a 20 page book review on my website, so you can just read that as a sub starter. And now on to the Muslim Jewish Forum of Greater Manchester. When we started, we made some design choices about its membership, which are pretty obvious, and its purpose, which was sort of less obvious, but I think we're actually quite important. Obviously all members are equal, you know, we were never going to have a situation where we had differential sort of voting power, but one of the key things is that we are just members. There is no special role for religious leaders. We do have religious leaders get involved occasionally, imams, rabbis, etc., but they have no special status at all. This is not a place where mosque leaders and synagogue leaders come together to talk. This is a forum for whoever wants to get involved and come along to an event gets involved. Similarly, we have no civic representation. I mean, we do have councillors on the forum executive, but only because they are people on the forum executive who just happen to be councillors. My co-chair got elected as a Labour councillor this May, so I'm delighted for her. So everybody is a grassroots. Obviously, the executive, we have 50-50 parity in terms of membership. We have two co-chairs. Everybody's a volunteer, so we run on a shoestring, which is really helpful because it means that we don't need lots of money to keep going. I mean, we really do run on an absolute shoestring. Our annual turnover is <coughs> maybe sort of £3,000 a year, if that. And most of that is sort of events money if we run a dinner or something like that. We, we need next to nothing to operate. And that's absolutely important if you're going to keep going. And the second thing is our objectives. And this is from our Memorandum of Association. And if you read this, the key point is that it's all about Greater Manchester. And we wrote it that way round, rather than saying it's not about Israel and Palestine. Because it just sounds more positive. There's nothing about Israel and Palestine in there. Anything to do with Israel and Palestine is out of scope. And for the last 11 years, I, I and the other members of the executive have consistently had to 
slap down, reject, refuse, say no to people from either the Muslim community or the Jewish community who want to talk about Israel and Palestine. We just don't. The nearest we've come to it is that after Operation Cast Lead, there was overwhelming <coughs> desire to do something and Jane Clements, who is now the director of the Council of Christians and Jews, and this is where I first came across Jane, although I didn't actually attend that event because my diary had me in London, but afterwards I had lunch with her and established a relationship. She held a facilitated listening event about Operation Cast Lead, where I think 10 Muslims and 10 Jews were able to sit in a chair and say what they felt, then the next person sits in the chair and says what they felt. It was no debate, no dialogue, no discussion, but you're able to share what you think. And that's the closest we've ever come. And at times, I be you become very unpopular by refusing to get involved, but I know that if we ever did, we would never talk about anything else, and it's immensely mm -hmm. divisive. Mm -hmm. And we used to have a sister organisation called Shalom Hey Salam in <coughs> Paris. They organised themselves, partly by example from us, but they weren't as formal, they didn't have a legal entity, they were, had a Facebook group for communications, and in 2014, with the Gaza conflict, they just fell apart. They were so upset with each other, so many people were posting things on the Facebook page, which <coughs> you're also hard to moderate, because you can't moderate the thing, and they just disintegrated. So, why, do it, why does it work? As I said, it runs on a shoestring. We're not accountable to anybody. We put on events that we like to organize and that we like to attend. So we have lots of eating events because <laughs> people like eating. We have a kosher meal every year. We've taken to having an Asian vegetarian meal every year, even though we recognize that that excludes the odd Orthodox Jewish person who won't eat vegetarian food because it's not kosher, when it's not kosher. But we decided that that was a sacrifice worth making because it gets us quite a lot of extra Muslim people who come along who don't, who don't yet feel confident and comfortable enough going to a kosher restaurant because it just feels different from the kind of food they normally eat. And we have very limited objectives. Our objectives are simply to get some Muslims and some Jews in Greater Manchester who are willing to talk to each other to attend things together. We've had all kinds of events, which I will give you a list of in a moment. And we have nothing to do with the Middle East. So just some of our recent events, a group of us went off to Blackburn when the Fusion Awards were on. We had a, a quiz. Uh, most of the attendance of the quiz was Jewish. I think there was only one Muslim out of about 20 odd people. But this is our first ever quiz. I mean, we regularly take part in the Jewish Rep Council quiz in the Manchester area. And we have always enter a mixed team for that. Kosher meal every year, I mentioned an interfaith party with other religions as well. Uh, we had a, a literary event where we had Muslim and Jewish authors speaking. Uh, some of our people were very active speaking in schools, talking about hummus and peace. And so I, me I mentioned the community quiz. We had a twinning event for bringing mosques and synagogues together in Berry Town Hall. The annual lawyers event is always very popular. It's a very simple format. We have a chairman, and we have two Muslim lawyers and two Jewish lawyers. We, give, we have an agreed subject. Everybody gets you know, five minutes worth of prepared remarks, and it's just Q&A. But we always get a packed audience. We've had nine annual picnics so far. Dead easy to organize. You just pick a park, and everybody <coughs> brings their own food and shares it. The iftar is very popular. Uh, again, for this we actually lay on kosher food for those who want proper kosher food and then uh, vegetarian Asian food. We went, we've been to Brussels. We, in fact, there's a sort of little holiday grouping of about five or six of us. We started off in 2009 by visiting Auschwitz and then the following year we went to uh, the Alhambra, we've been to Marrakesh, we've been to Dubrovnik, we've been to Brussels. A much larger group went to Paris. This year we're going to Portugal. And we had a trip to the old Orthodox synagogue in Liverpool last year and the oldest mosque in the UK, which is in Liverpool, combined those. We were trying to go to Bradford this year, but that fell through, but we'll try next year. Because in Bradford, there is a reformed synagogue, which has actually had real help from the local Muslim community to pave the roof repairs and so on. 
we spoke, we had two of the three religious speakers at the We Stand Together national launch in Manchester, organised by the police. The, the Manchester launch took place before the London launch, so Manchester again led the way on this. And one of the highlights for last year was a pe petition to preserve religious slaughter in the UK. The, the, the British Veterinary Association had organised a petition, and after 10 months, they had their 100,000 signatures, there was going to be a parliamentary debate. One of my Jewish colleagues from the forum got in touch and said, we need a counter <coughs> petition. He drafted it, I amended it and uploaded it. It was in my name, because you, you can only have one name on a petition for Parliament. And we got 100,000 signatures in nine days, and we were mentioned three times in the parliamentary debate on the VETS petition. So that's it. Uh, that is my sort of short take on Muslim Jewish